When asked to talk about power, I thought I would take on a really small topic, which is what is power and how do we think about power today? So power, if you look it up in the dictionary, is pretty simple. It's about the ability to act or to do something. Um, political national strength, uh, the ability to, to, or the possession of control or command over, over others. So generally, we can talk about, there's, there are people that talk about hard power, soft power. Um, I don't know if these lights want to go down a little bit. So hard power, soft power, smart power, which basically military power, economic power, and diplomacy as well. And you can find all sorts of definitions about a smart power as being the combination of hard power and soft power strategies. But what kind, when, where, with who, under what circumstances, often it seems heuristic at best as to how you begin to deploy these different kinds of power. So I want to frame the context now very briefly, and very briefly. Um, and I want to do it with one, uh, with one kind of construct, which is this TIMN framework for the evolution of societies. David Ronfeld has proposed TIMN as the evolution of societies. So tribes, and all of them are based upon forms of communication interconnectivity. Tribes is an oracular tradition that you face to face pretty much. Institutions, the minute you have the printing press, you can hand out pamphlets, you can give instructions, you can begin to support institutions. Markets, we understand. The minute people are moving around, you can begin to make goods move around. And networks, and we know what networks are. But the interesting thing is that it's not so interesting to say, well, first we had tribes, then we had institutions, then we have markets, and now we have networks, because that's not the way it works. In Venice, you had tribes, and you had institutions, and you had markets, and you had networks. The interesting thing is that each one of these, as they evolve, places something new in the system and begins to solve some of the problems you had with the former one. But most interesting, the disruption we're feeling, the change we're feeling, the change from the kind of, uh, well, von Clauschwitz to T.E. Lawrence, is the understanding that we are moving from a triformist era, everything with butt networks, into a quadriformist era, where networks are a principal, principal component in the system. The disruption we are feeling is the movement from a, this triformist into the quadriformist. And it's not simple. Because this is an unprecedented shift, shift because networks are not things. They're not entities. And they belong to everybody. And they move fast. And they're pervasive. And they can go on and on and on. So it's not a simple move from a triformist era of three entities to a quadriformist era of four. It is a distinctly, distinctly different era. And so we've got the time protester of the year, person of the year as the protester. And the fascinating thing is not so, it's, I mean, the political ramifications and the political um, uh, conversations were really, really interesting. But it was also the fact that the logistics were being passed from one to the other. The lessons of Tunisia were, weren't just inspirational, they were practical. There, was a, there were user manuals, manuals being put out on how to topple a regime how to protect yourself from tear gas, how to begin to influence people. So this is this notion of supercharging the kind of, the kind of situation of this. Because of the interconnectedness from networks, identity constructs, constructs are shifting. We're moving from Martha Nussbaum's um, idea of identity as a series of concentric circles, me, my family, my community, and the world, to one where we really have to look at identity as instead what we call the networks of intimacy. The minute we saw the world as not a horizon line, but as a thing that we all owned and took charge of, was the beginning we began to work within uh, a different kind of network. This comes from uh, a quote by uh, Ernesto Pujol, who said, globalism is a network of intimacies. It finds profound traits of the human condition in common despite site-specific differences. The interesting thing is the more connected we become, the bigger our problems become. The epidemics, the climate change, everything. But at the same time, and I use Babel, which I won't go into, but which is a, a, a movie in which four stories are intimately connected. Four personal stories with face-to-face -face personal relationships are now connected across great distances, both serendipitously and non-serendipitously, 
unlike ever before. So there's a paradox here, and there's an opportunity in the paradox. The more connected we become, the more difficult the problems become, and the larger the scale. But also, we now have means to work on them through interconnectivity, through citizen science, through monetary democracy, all sorts of things that are in the air. So how do we affect outcomes of things happening in our environment? How do we work on contexts and not only content? So I want to talk about from simply reframing the problem, which is what I just did for you possibly, um, to how do we actually create ecosystems of change? And we do need new methods and mechanisms. But we already have things in the work. We have reality mining going on. Tremendous amounts of information you can get data of. Micro narratives, stories, the ability to listen to stories and actually turn stories which are analog into digital information so that we can look at storyscapes to understand where, um, where there are possibilities for change and where it's very, very static. Uh, boundaries, probes, and modulators, which are really the ways you work on complex systems. Studio-based methods and approaches and games, all of these things. We have lots of new methods and mechanisms in the system. Um, I'm going to skip over this. Uh, I do want to talk about now a scaffold, a way to put power together, a way that it becomes less of a heuristic device. And the scaffold is driven or fueled by vision. Vision is about sight, it's about perception, and it's about the imagination. It's not just, oh, I've got a really good idea. It's image-based, and it leads into what we call world building in the cinema world. The interesting thing is about, until about 15 years ago, until the Minority Report, which was the first one, all films were constructed by taking the story, the narrative, and creating a series of storyboards and then filming the storyboards. With Minority Report, for the first time, they built the world digitally inside the computer, created not only the rooms or the settings for the scenes, but they created the city, the social laws, the protocols, the economic structure, everything was created as a world that then the characters and even the writers began to be inside of. A very, very different approach where you say, here's the world we want to build. Harry Potter is a new example. Certainly, The Hunger Games is another one that's come out most recently. But here is the world we can envision, not just here's how we fix problems. Here's the world we envision. What's the gap between that and what we have now? And what are the power components we need to close that gap, to go from what we have to, to what we can imagine? And so um, I was at a Highlands Forum, which is a wonderful discussion group put together by Dick O'Neill um, last year, and just sketched out from some of our conversations about power the idea of the change triangle, which is a scaffold for change. I will qualify that. Scaffold, not framework. A scaffold, if you know anything about regeneration of tissue, uh, like we can talk about organs, but we can also talk about skin, a scaffold is put in place with the intention that it merely supports the emergence of the skin until the skin is no longer vulnerable, and then the scaffold goes away. Scaffolds are not intended to stay in the system. They are intended to aggregate. In this, in this situation, this is a scaffold for aggregating different kinds of power and different mechanisms that are now out there. So the change triangle really consists of five elements. You have to have a vision, which is the world build, building part. Oops. Um, Meta-narrative, micro-narratives, mechanisms, and social networks, which I will explain. So the idea is that the meta-narrative is the narrative at the top. It is the thing that is strategically ambiguous, the thing that we can all begin to head towards. The American dream, that was a meta-narrative. If we're going to create change, political change, do we need a new meta-narrative, right? So it is a thing that we all head towards um, despite our differences. So the issue is that the meta-narrative has to be a positive narrative. Arab Spring, there was a narrative, which is just get rid of the existing political structure. But after that, there was no meta-narrative to replace it that began to aggregate and keep the, the kind of consistency and the coherence to the group. Micro-narratives, these are all the stories on the bottom. These are the events we live. These are the lives we create. These are all the things that are 
personal, not ambiguous. We construct identity. We perceive our world around ourselves by that. And then we create behavior off of that. So there are lots of kinds of stories. Amy's going to talk this afternoon about uh, stories. But meta narratives are one type. Myths are another type. Stories that we use to make sense of events. Small stories to shape events and also to build trust. All kinds of stories we use to form identity, to understand our world, and then to behave and act around. So now, within meta narrative, we have ideas of world building. These are new ideas. It's not just about uh, you know, the, 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 the same um, uh, kind of simple dictatorial way of saying this is what we will do, but it's about conceiving or constructing a whole new world. Micro narratives, I talked a little bit about data mining. We have ways to get at the data. We have ways, you know, what, what you're eating, where you go, how often you're at the gym, every time you swipe your card, your credit card, every time you get into a building, every time you go on Skype, every time you buy anything pops up the little ad that, that, that shows you, there's that one with the, you know, getting fat and skinny all at once. You know, we have a whole new way of getting at granular data about all of us, and it's out there. Um, and then there's Dave Snowden's work. These are just some where it's a, uh, he uses anticipatory awareness. He uses a way to take to collect, not send out um, uh, surveys, but collect stories, personal stories, ask people their perceptions around them, translate into digital data so we can actually find patterns within it. Mechanisms. So mechanisms, very, very important. Mechanisms are things that do work. Mechanisms, we put them into the system from it's on the side because that seems to make sense. But the interesting thing about mechanisms is mechanisms can be used on meta narratives, on micro narratives, but even at what is at the inside of the uh, triangle, which is the social network. There are lots and lots of smart power components relative to these mechanisms. But ARGs, alternate reality, lane, re reality games, Elon Lee will tell you a story with Edoc Laundry that many people believe affected getting the, getting the a certain generation out to vote, which affected the, the election, the last election. Jeff Gomez's work on transmedia, which is uh, very much about world building. Mechanisms work on all parts of the system. So at the interior of the triangle is my fifth component, social networks. And that is, and it's not just social networks, it's all the networks that hold us together. And these things have form. And we can also, there are mechanisms to work on transforming networks. There are plenty of books out that talk about the structure and the shape of networks, the idea of structural holes, the idea of nodes connecting, et cetera, et cetera. This is just one example of a project in which uh, some work was done through AI basically social bots to take this network and after, um, after two weeks, this is what the network looked like by putting social bots into the system and beginning to knit together different things. So the last thing I want to talk about to, to perhaps cement this a little bit is the idea of the shape of the triangle and it'll, it'll show a little bit how it works. So if you know Dead Poets Society, this is a triangle in which there's one meta narrative, comes to seven people, comes down. It's a very, very simple connective tissue. Babel, on the other hand, is a series of four stories, probably, let's, with all the people involved, two dozen micro narratives that are linked in a much more complex network of relationships. So we have a change, we have a shift in the shape of the triangle. Before, which would also be the Dead Poets Society, it really was control coming from the top. We now have a situation with the Arab Spring and with all of these networks in the work where we can see a different shape that can be used. If you're designing this, you can begin to think about designing a shape where the micro narratives become more potent and they actually become closer to the top. So a final thought. Um, if you can imagine, if you can think about you know, designing these triangles for, for change, and it's very critical to think about the networks and how that determines the shape of the thing. Well, the final thought is that triangles are fractal in nature. And so can we think about not just one triangle for change, but several, and begin to think about actually landscapes of change? This is an amazing, amazing crystal which has embedded triangles in it. 
So I want to thank you very much, and this is uh, where we end. Thank you.